This week, Dan Nault from Imperva's with us to discuss the current state of data security in the cloud. Then Eric Tice from YPro joins us to talk about the state of software supply chain security. Finally, in the enterprise security news, don't worry, IT and security funding is okay. And we have the proof in the form of at least 16 funding announcements today. Private equity firms are taking advantage of the dip in valuations to make a few acquisitions, no before and forge rock. Legal drama, we'll discuss the Joe Sullivan case. More legal drama, we'll discuss the Splunk Cribble battle. Crypto drama, another week, another crypto exchange losing half a billion dollars. New insights on breaches and ransomware and two new reports from Scientia Labs. Cybersecurity leaders have a hard time keeping companies secure and cyber nutrition labels. All this and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Week. Don't leave the door open. Secure your APIs with the Curity Identity Server. Curity allows you to centralize identity management policies with a solution developed by an expert team using well-established standards. Curity facilitates scalable security for apps and websites by offering a unique combination of identity and access management with API security. Protect your users, secure apps and websites, manage API access. Start your free trial today at securityweekly.com forward slash Curity. Companies big and small are using AwareGo's Human Risk Assessment to measure the human risk factor in cybersecurity. This interactive solution allows companies to measure employees' knowledge and behavior across threat vectors such as phishing, passwords, sensitive data, and more. After completing the assessment, CISOs can identify vulnerable departments and roles and improve internal policies or procedures. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash awarego to start your free trial. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy International Plain Language Day. This is episode 292 recorded on Thursday, October 13th, 2022. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is the Master of Marketing, the Mayor of Mayhem, President of the Keanu Reeves Fan Club, Tyler Shields. How are you? How are you? <laughs> that That's actually true. I am the president of my local chapter of the Keanu Reeves fan club. Most people didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is absolutely 100% not true. I hate Keanu Reeves. <laughs> uh, somebody sniffing around your face there. Yeah, that's, that's my little friend, Bogey. That's my guy down there. For those of you who don't know, my, my dog, Bogey. That's a great name, Bogey. <laughs> yeah, he's one too many. Yeah, so bogey, speaking of plain language day, that is spelled P-L-A-I-N, not P-L-A-N-E. Oh, uh, all, all yeah. this time, Adrian, all this time, I thought it was because we were talking about uh, airplane pilots. Nope. Nope. <laughs> okay. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit more about that just after I introduce our second host here, our second co-host. The Czar of Zero Trust, the captain of content, Katie Teitler. How are you, Katie? I am fine, but I did somewhat have a feeling that Tyler would go to the really bad pun on airplanes. Tyler, you're did. just predictable. Yeah, totally. But I yeah. do like your dog. Bogey's very cute. He's a good boy. Yeah, yeah. Pets on podcasts uh, is uh, always makes a podcast better. <laughs> Why did you put your beard? When did I grow a beard? Is that what you asked me? No, I said, what did you put in your beard? It's called old age. That's why it's white. I didn't put anything in my beard. No, I was bogey his, licking you. His natural sweet, natural sweet essence. That's nope. right. That's right. Not buying it. Nope. So international plain language. Um, so I, I, I thought this was appropriate given this is a cybersecurity podcast. Uh, the, the actual text right off the website for it was, have you ever read a report, blog post, or other form of written communication? Did you have trouble understanding what you're reading? If so, it may be because it was not written with clear and simple language or because you're an infosec and you're reading a vendor's website. <laughs> <laughs> or a press release. 
Yeah, yeah, or a press release, or you know, something from uh, your legal uh, team. Yeah, you know, yeah. We it, it it seems like we're full of it, you know, full of content like that in this industry, we're just and full of it. <laughs> we're we're just full of it. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking about putting together like like a scoring system uh, for press releases. You know, and, and plain language would be, you know, w- w- one of the categories of, of scoring for that, right? Like, uh, did you actually tell me anything new about the company? You know, was I able to understand it? Uh, you know, the amount of uh, buzzwords and, and uh, um, you know, just the general readability of it. You know, I, I, th- I think it would be fun to have like a scoring system for, for press releases, uh, if not just for um rating other people's press releases than for putting together my own right and isn't there i think there's a plugin and i don't know this for sure but i want to say there's a plugin for um uh, wordpress maybe or even it might be like a grammarly kind of thing that there's yeah. a, an actual approved academic way of creating the simplicity of uh written language <laughs> Have you seen yes. that, that? What I'm talking about? Yes, and I forget. It has a name. It has a very specific name. Maybe somebody yes, the something in something uh, score. Yes, maybe somebody in Discord can uh, uh, clue us in here because I do not remember the name of it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah, that could be a piece of your of your um, uh, your formula for determining if press press releases are are full of garbage or not. Right? We can give it that score. We can look at the number of uh, security specific buzzwords in use. We can determine a, a binary yes or no, whether it actually says something, like yeah. is there actual value in it, and then just kind of tabulate the score, and there you go. Yeah. There's actually a lot of hate for Grammarly in InfoSec, and I'm not sure I fully understand that. I think it might be that it reads all your stuff, you know, and it's a SaaS service. So, yeah, it does have access to probably some private communications, but I, I've always, it, it's really helped me in my writing. I've always found it really useful. I'm a huge fan of it. Anything that does plain language for me is is a win. Yeah. All right. Uh, get moving on here. We have one announcement here. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit Security Weekly. <laughs> Actually, Katie, you could do this one. You did this one earlier, didn't you? You want to take it? You want me? You want me to read it? Okay. Read it. Uh, where do we go? Where do we go? Oh, I scrolled off the wrong page. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, no. That went well. Okay, I got it. I got it. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com backslash subscribe to subscribe to any of our podcast feeds and have all new episodes downloaded right to your phone. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. One critique, forward slash. Forward slash. You're right. And Forward I said slash. that in the intro, <laughs> but you caught me off guard. I'm not wearing my glasses. So I'm. if we do it again, I can see that it's forward instead of backslash. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm just feeling, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm having coffee instead of whiskey. I'm, I'm uh, having you read some of my, my stuff here. I'm just off my game a little bit today. It's okay. Apparently, <laughs> I can't see the difference between a forward and a backslash. I can't see anything without my glasses. So fun fact. No worries. All right, let's get to our first interview today. This interview is sponsored by Imperva. Today's topic is the current state of cloud security, what you need to know. And we're excited to have Dan Nault, uh, SVP and GM of data, data Security at Imperva with us today. Dan has helped build and grow some of the most recognizable tech companies in the world at Microsoft, AWS, NetApp, Samsung, and as a founder and CEO at Stellus Technologies. At Imperva, Dan is focused on helping customers solve complex data security challenges. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Adrian. Great to have the opportunity to uh, to talk with you and everyone today. Uh, and I think you were looking for the Flesh Kincaid grade level uh, for the rating of simplicity, and I'll, yeah. I'll aim to try to keep it somewhere in the eight to nine, so you can let me know how I do with that. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's going to be a theme for the whole show. We get we keep the language plain and and understandable, you know. And that's you know something I noticed early in my career, especially when I became uh, an industry analyst. I would get briefings from a lot of vendors, and I you know would just I wasn't shy in stopping people and saying, "Hey, that that term you're using, I have no idea what that is." Like the first time somebody started talking about POVs, I was like, 
point of view. Like, what? this doesn't fit the context. And they're talking about proof of value. So somebody decided proof of concept, you know, wasn't the right term. And they started using proof of value. And, you know, that's how I encountered that. And, and that's how I learned that north, south, and east, west have different definitions depending on who you talk to. You know, so when you're talking about networks and uh, north, south, and east, west, don't assume everybody knows what you're talking about. You know, so language is, uh, you know, clarity is, is pretty important there. And, um, yeah, so so speaking of language and cloud, you know, almost all our language for, for cloud and, and data security has emerged in the last <laughs> 10 to 15 years. Um, so, so, Dan, help us understand, like, like, you know, maybe you can give uh, the short version of, of, you know, how, how we've come since uh, cloud has popped up and, you know, we didn't know if people were going to totally move to cloud and get rid of their data centers. Clearly, they haven't. But, um, you know, where, where, where does our data live now? You know, what, what's the current state there? Well, the, the world of cloud has is, is changed an awful lot in the past few years. Uh, five years ago, I had, I had been at AWS for about a year. And uh, at that time, customers had decided that for business reasons, for agility, for speed, for lots of reasons, certain workloads were going to go to the cloud. And they were still figuring out you know, how mission critical a workload they were comfortable with, what level of scale they were taking their very high scale systems that had been running on the most powerful computers in the world and figuring out what could, what could go on the cloud. So that's, that's about five years ago. And now you go five years prior to that, um, we are still in the world of I'm going to burst to cloud for certain parts of workloads. I'm going to have an architecture right. where some will be in the cloud, some will be on prem. I remember doing what we called modern architectures back when I was at Microsoft, where you'd say, well, your core data, that's going to stay on prem, but then maybe you'll have something running as PaaS and then your SaaS layer, well, that can be entirely in the cloud. Certainly, and you called it modern. You, you yeah, called, called that it modern? modern. <laughs> yeah, I called that it aged modern. Well. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Isn't that nice? That was back when Windows Phone, remember Windows Phone in the olden days yeah. with that new, new UI that had the little tiles that was so cool on the phone, they put it on Windows. That was called yeah. modern. So yeah, you're right. Yep, that I remember that. Well. It, it looked it was, pretty cool because you could have live tiles. I thought live tiles were really neat. It, it's it, absolutely, absolutely. It, uh, but you know, there was innovation elsewhere and, and the rest is history. But yeah, modern is, is a pretty good sixth grade word. So it was, it was safe back then. So you fast forward to now and there are many companies that put their most mission critical systems on the cloud. And there are companies that say, hey, look, I, I see I'll put some of it on there now, but tell me what I have to think about and do to be comfortable over time moving more of it there. And, and what's interesting about this is these are you know world-class companies that like they know what they're doing. Say, so, hey, these apps, not quite yet. But then when they set out to go figure out you know, what is the leading edge, what can they do? What are they comfortable with? They know a lot about cloud uh, and they know a lot more about their previous world. And they're trying to sort, okay, how many of my assumptions, my experience, my, my judgment, how much of that is exactly the same in the cloud and how much is different? And I think that's that's it. It's it's pioneering and the pioneers have gotten to a, a new level of, of moving to the cloud. Uh, and it's it's mixed. It's going to be mixed. The world's going to be hybrid, multi-cloud for my lifetime. So, you, you know, it, it just showing the progress of the cloud, just the insane progress back when I was an industry analyst, I, I went to every AWS reInvent uh, for four years in a row. And I would give talks on how the, you know, the, the security practitioner role uh, is, is going to be changing. You know, a lot of it due to DevOps cloud, you know, and, and all the, um, you know, just the general speed of software development, you know, and how, how that's really changing uh, the role and the expectations. And as part of that, I would take a screenshot of the AWS console every year. And, you know, just to show how much is changing year over year. And this was back in the day when every single AWS product uh, had an icon, you know, would get crammed onto a single page, you know, and, and depending on what you wanted to do in AWS, you would click that icon, you go into EC2 or RDS or, you know, wh whatever you're going to do. 
and it got more and more organized over time. And now there's so many, they, they can't put them all on one page. So you just use a search bar or you, you browse the different products. You know, it's well over 200 products now. Um, you know, but I, I remember those days when it would jump from like 60 to 120 and, you know, eventually got to that point where that, that screenshot wasn't even possible anymore. Yeah, that that evolution. I was I was there for a little bit over five years, and it was in the database analytics and AI ML area. And it's fun to see kind of that uh, proliferation of technology. But that same proliferation of technology is off of the cloud too, right? You, you see it with Mongo and Snowflake is is on the cloud and multiple clouds. Yeah. You see a lot of innovation uh, that, uh, that that's emerged. You know that uh, on t- IT generally has become exciting and leading edge and even more capable with, uh, I'm going to say, the introduction of the new possibilities of these hybrid models. Yeah, so, and to be totally honest, I'm not sure I understand why somebody would use a Snowflake instead of AWS. You know, especially, like, I'm assuming most Snowflake uh, customers are also using one of the clouds who also have data offerings. You know, so I, I, I don't even fully understand the architectural decisions that go into some of that. Well, th- there's a, each of the, the call them hyperscalers, cloud service providers, each of them have certain capabilities on their own platform. Uh, AWS has a, a data warehouse. That's, it's like, uh, it's like Snowflake called Redshift. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, Snowflake can run on multiple clouds to provide customers that flexibility, but it, it uses the underlying services you talked about there being hundreds of services snowflake uses many of the aws services just like when it's working on azure it runs on multiple azure services and it's there's nothing about it that limits it it just takes advantages of those and you know uh one of the reasons that's very interesting is um i take customers however they are and most of my customers have on prem and are on one cloud or multiple clouds and they say you have to protect all of it, regardless of where it is. And then it all becomes about, you know, how simple can I make that? So if I'm, for example, covering covering Snowflake and on AWS covering Redshift and I'm covering Teradata, I mean, the answer to that has to be yes, in a way, which is, I think, part of what keeps it fun. So so I have a, I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed, because I work in a company that does some form of, quote, cloud security, um, is it feels like when when I hear prospects or customers or, or people out there in market, cloud security engineers, whatever, when I ask them, what's your definition of cloud security, I get a different definition depending on the role of the person that I'm talking to. Can you help me understand how you or Imperva or even just you in general, how you would define the word cloud security, the, the words cloud security? And is it a breadth of, of different technology solutions, capabilities? Is it a single technology that you use to do cloud security? How do you approach it? So it's, 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 a, great, it's a great question, Tyler. So um, cloud by its name means with these elastic hyperscaler types, some companies will say I have a cloud security product and they're only looking at a single cloud. So whether it's single cloud or if it's if it's multi-cloud, we'll just take that as one of the different dimensions. Uh, and then when you're looking at the security of the cloud, uh, it's all the way down from the the infrastructure, the compute, the storage, all the way at the top, the apps, things that are connecting to it. And then a lot of it is around the data tier, which is where where I focus, is for all of your data stores. So just think uh, S3, or you might have a data warehouse, you might have a relational database or a non-relational database any of those things that's running on it, that needs to be secure. And and when I say secure at that level, uh, in the olden days, we'd always just call it them for database activity monitoring. But just think of it as anything, anything that is a data store, you need to be watching for behavior with and having a judgment about that behavior. And in the world of cloud, you can have a database that would run as infrastructure as a service, which is in a way running in a non-differentiated way, just like it is on-prem. So you'd watch that. You could have a little agent running on that. And you know, and, and that's fine and that scales to a certain point. But often in the world of cloud, you have many different databases running in a managed way. And then you'll have logs that come out of those. 
And that's referred to as agentless. So a couple of years ago, Imperva acquired a, a company called JSONAR. It's a foundation of our sonar technology that works at really limitless scale to go against agentless databases running on any breadth of cloud. So when I hear cloud security, it's like, all right, what tier am I at? First of all, what cloud am I at? Or am I multi-cloud? Then what layer am I at? Then at, at that layer, what type of store am I looking at? Is it analytics or is it databases? And then is it something that is can be done based on logs with telemetry? Or is it something that has to have an agent? And just one thing I'll add to that is when you're talking about the world of cloud and cloud security, uh, most uh, most customers, when they're monitoring their data stores in an, in an on-prem world, will be very selective about it. They'll just take part of it. But in, in the world of cloud, you tend to have broader telemetry to monitor what's going on because it's a little further away and anything you can do to watch it will help you there. So cloud security to me is covering your fleet of your, because I'm, I'm a data security owner, covering yeah. the fleet of your data estate in any cloud that you're at. So I don't distinguish between them, sure. but you know there'll be people that'll say cloud security and they're just talking a pretty simple discovery thing in cloud. I, that doesn't solve a lot yeah. of business needs. Yeah, yeah, that's what we've seen, right? I've seen uh, cloud security can be as generic as show me all my assets in the cloud, right? Like just, I don't even know what's there. Uh, all the way up through, you know, we want agents installed in every workload and be able to monitor the workloads and and memory changes and syscalls at a workload layer, or uh, it could be a data centric view. It could also be, I've even heard people come up and say they want cloud security. And when I press on them, they say, yeah, you know, I need somebody to secure my Salesforce, my HubSpot and my, you know, insert other SaaS, SaaS providers here, which Oof. isn't cloud security as, as I define right. it, but it certainly makes sense in, you know, in a fundamental layer of they are cloud centric services you're using, right? So there's just so many ways to describe it. And it's such an overloaded term. Um, you know, do you think as a security practitioner, when I target the, the cloud, uh, not the not the SaaS cloud, but the cloud that you and I would traditionally link this to, where do we start? Do we start with visibility? Do we start with workload analysis? Do we start with data data storage uh, security? Do we start with authentication authorization based monitoring and, and checks for uh, actions at the auth layer? How do you how do you get going in cloud security at a basic level? I think at a basic level, it's take take what we're used to from on prem of uh, having awareness of where all the stores are and then the architecture of how those stores are being used to serve up apps. And then look for the behavior that you uh, that you want to protect against or learn about the activities you want to look at. There's there's the basics of making sure that security as it is in any infrastructure, because the cloud is just a bunch of services, even though it's uh, servers running services that are elastic and microservice based and all that. But it's uh, a lot of the fundamentals of the infrastructure are pretty close to the same. Where it starts being different is in the world of cloud. Uh, the the data might go to whatever your your object layer might be, and then the data that you know one day is in that, uh, and then you decide to go build a trained machine learning model, or you put into a data warehouse, or you go run it in a key value store, or maybe you run it in a, a relational database. It moves around more, if you will. So it's the the data stores, the movement of the data in the stores, the sensitivity of the data in the stores. And because the data is in a way freed up in the cloud to move around more across different engines and not being held to uh, as narrowly as on-prem, I, I, I think you need to do, you know you need to look at your get your info right, look at your data architecture and your data flows, and mm -hmm. then take a look at your personas. And this is where it gets very interesting because it's more flexible. You have more personas doing more use cases more quickly. And uh, if, if you haven't designed to be able to monitor all that, you're going to be um, chasing what the business just did because the business is going to go do things because of the business value. So I, I, I think it's a, a story of being proactive. Like the, the, the delay between, okay, I've got this data store, uh, monitored, managed, I see the events coming through, I'm using 
machine learning or whatever. We use machine learning and algorithms to say, okay, this is a good behavior. This isn't a good behavior. You know, it used to be, okay, I'm going to do one type of database now. And two years from now, I'm going to do another database. And in the world of cloud, it's two months from now, I'm going to do another database or maybe two weeks or maybe tomorrow. So it sounds, it sounds like a lot of it, you know, like, like it's, it's just, um, documentation, you know, and discipline about, you know, how, how you, you know, create new products internally, you know, like you know, almost like you need PRDs for these things. Right. Um, where, where do you start with the company? You know, I, I think you already said it a little bit here, you know, you've got to discover the data, uh, you've got to understand the, the, the data flows and, and then the, the, the personas. And, and when you say personas, I assume you, you mean, you know, what, what, what is the, what is the actual workflow look like? You know, how, how is somebody going to, how is this data being used? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're tracking exactly. So, um, so most of the world is in this status of taking things that have been running on-prem, keeping some of it on-prem, taking some of it and putting it in the cloud. So in that world, you need to do uh, discovery and then data classification by sensitivity with the privacy to understand what they have. And then from that, understand what all their constituents or their, you know, their the, the different personas that are running it, what the, the workloads are that are running and what those workflows are. And then they need to take a look at in this, this slightly different world, um, you know, what's going to change and what's going to stay the same. And then take their knowledge that they have about the day state, the current state, and then take a look at the future state and then realize that even if it to start with, looks similar in certain ways. Let's just say that it's a combination of some stuff on IaaS and some stuff running as a managed service. Just know that over time, more of it's going to be managed and over time, more of it will be running in different data engines mm -hmm. uh, with those different workloads. And it, it's an interesting tee up because like in the old world, DBAs did certain things super well and were invaluable. Like they do like exactly things at a lot of different levels to the database. Well, in the world of cloud, we have a managed database. Things that DBAs know the best in the universe still matter a lot. But those people that like have those skill sets, some of that other stuff, it's like, no, I don't have to worry about that anymore. But you have to worry about some other things. You have to worry about the cloud security and you have to worry about the architecture behind the data and then the, the data security in a holistic sense. And I say that because just as when you when you're moving into cloud, the the data is is freed up to work in different ways. Um, it's critical to have the right talent in any company, and and I would say that you can have consultants come, you can have vendors help you, but companies, every customer, should have people on their team that know uh, what a DBA needs to know in the cloud, plus the cloud security, plus the data security. And I, uh, they have different names on them, but they're not, they're not quite enterprise architects and they're not quite right. DBAs. They're not, they're not quite those things, but they, they are that Cl massive. cloud engineer, right? Uh, cloud, you know, you know, sure. You just coined it. And, and <laughs> the great word about it, a cloud engineer, that's like kind a, of a cover all. One. So we're, right? we're good. That's yeah. good. Plain language. Yeah, yeah. Somebody in the uh, in our Discord chat, uh, our live chat, was just talking about uh, moving from one job to another uh, with the same exact title in each job, but completely different jobs. You know, completely different uh, role and and responsibilities, which, which doesn't surprise me at all. You know, with with, uh, with a term as as simple as you know, cloud security or or, or cloud engineer. But um, yeah, yeah, certainly. You know, I. I you know, where I started out in IT, you know, our, our DBAs were worried about, uh, you know, kernel configuration, semaphores, the SGA size, stuff like that, <laughs> you know, tuning the performance of our Oracle databases. And I, I'm sure those folks are happy that all that's abstracted away now and they, they can let somebody else worry about the actual underlying performance of the, the database where they just worry about, uh, um, database structure and architecture and things like that. Um, well, I, I would just encourage anybody who's got any free time because they've been liberated to start really going crazy into security because there's a, you know, it's a, there's a, there's a lot more that's out there to look at than there was a, a few years ago. 
you know, and yeah. for those of us that get into security and see uh, all the different things you have to pay attention to, and then frankly, take a look at the, the subset of it that compliance looks at, at some point, the compliance is going to catch up with the security stuff. So I think that there's going to be a, a lot more work to do coming soon, frankly. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the big things I saw recently is a lot of third party tools require access to your cloud, require access to your data. And uh, I, I saw a report or something. Somebody had done some research or wrote a report. Um, and, I, and one of the findings was it was a very high percentage, like 80 percent of comp of um, uh, third parties and uh, and tools that need access to your cloud to do their job, you know, be it monitoring or, uh, you, you know, may maybe, you know, UX monitoring or, or performance monitoring of your application, um, ask for way too much, way, way too many permissions. And I, I think that's something that, uh, you know, we're currently kind of kind of blind to. You know, we just follow the instructions to set up the app, and once it's working, you know, it's it's good, right? Like we're not going to second guess, uh, you know, the IAM role, you know, and AWS that they have us create. You know, we we assume they've followed some kind of least privilege uh, design principle, you know, when when asking for that, and, and apparently not so much, <laughs> not so much. Uh, a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, third party products out there will will ask for uh a, a lot of permissions you know be able to see all your data and and just understanding that like like there's a lot of risk just tied up in that yeah you know we 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 hear this from customers in 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 a following way uh reduce the edges uh make make it all work together in a way that um that they can get confident that if they've uh, given us access to some of their secure data they can um work within our surface area with other third party uh technologies that plug in and maybe to uh to put into context of why I, I uh I launched our our suite which is uh the activity monitoring the analytics and then the display in a way that uh a non security genius can look at and understand something that happened and what they need to go do so we use plain uh, language computer. you might say Plain language. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so we use a combination of, of uh, machine learning algorithms to take a look at the thousands of events that happened and what three or five really mattered. And then in you know, mm. plainly show, hey, you guys better dig into this one. You better understand what happened here. But um, but what customers have, have asked us for is cover the entire fleet from you know mainframe, mini, on-prem, colo, clouds, cover all of that to take away that edge. And they've also asked us to cover all data, uh, structured, semi-structured, non-structured data, cover all of that data. And we do that with partners to, to make sure we're covering all of it. And when you think about that, it's, you know, you can have data stores that are running in multiple clouds and then uh, ones that are not cloud uh, natively, but can run in a cloud because they can run an IaaS. Yeah. So we have to cover that you, whole surface area. You guys work with mainframes, right? We do. We have a nice mainframe team on Austin, and uh, I know them well because you know it's a valuable assets still on the mainframe. You bet. You know, um, so uh, but it's this that broad thing, and then being able to work with us to cover all of that, which requires us to have a strong partner play. We use partners, you know, to make sure that we're managing their data well. We use partners for context data, like for our our machine learning for training or to look for exceptions. We'll have features like Mark, uh, Workday or Splunk or uh, ServiceNow to go take a look at that. And then we also uh, work with third parties for data capabilities we don't have, like data masking, or we work with third parties for mm -hmm. encryption. So it's that that's, that's the play I'm doing is to make it easier for customers to get the business benefits of covering all of it, whether on the cloud or on-prem. Maybe put another way, if, if you're going into the cloud, uh, we're probably ahead of you, so uh, we'll be able to cover you. So, so what does that what does that implement implementation journey look like? Uh, like using your product, for example, you know, you, you've got a customer come to you and they've got stuff in the cloud, they got a mainframe, you know, they get they've got on prem, they've got Snowflake. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of companies out there that that just look like a uh, a sample pack of of data 
products and projects where they've got at least one of everything. Uh, where do you start, and 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 what does that what does that journey look like as you, you know, with with a requirement of <laughs> we we want to see all of it and and manage all of it. Um, well, we do. We do use POV for proof of value, <laughs> but yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> what it what it starts with is is um, uh, you basically go, need to go set up the sensors, if you will, the agents or agent list to get the data in to monitor the things that are critical, and then have the alerts. Now, some customers that's all they want: just bring all the data, bring it all together, show the monitoring, show me all the activities that happened, and I'll go sort it out. And you know, any more. Uh, there are some customers that are doing purely on-prem. It, it varies mm -hmm. different parts of the world, and different industries, but most of them, it's a mix of agents and agentless. And we have many customers that just go purely agentless, no agents at all, because it's much faster to get up provision at, at a very wide scale. But one, one of the things that uh, we always like to be able to show is, uh, you know, using our you know, self-training machine learning, Let's go watch it for a little while, and then we'll show you if there's something that's really exceptional. And right. that, you know, that's a light up. So the first one, I'll say, you know, it can, it can take a period of, you know, a shorter period, you know, days, weeks, whatever. And then building the trained model so that it's really tuned takes a little while to self-train for their environment and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, so that that is a good in itself, and it, and it shows that to that. But the what I see from the customers that are by using a, a broader fleet is when they're covering a broader area, they need this path of simplicity amongst the complexity. So the the data comes in and is displayed in a single place where the, they can go take a look at it and just make sure that the system is well monitored for that sense of confidence and then take a look at the history of different things that have happened. Um, so it's a sequence. And you know, we have a we have a professional services organization and it's relatively small. We work with SIs. We have a number of customers that want to know it all themselves, so they do it all themselves, or they work with with their partners. You know, we're we're agnostic about that, um, but we have a yeah. pretty good group of you know SESAs that go help customers set that up. Yeah, I assume you, you know talking about the anomalies that you look for. One of the easiest ones is is just a systematic, you know, scrape or or dump of an entire data store. You know, and, and and we see a lot of breaches where this happens. And it, you know, I'm I'm sitting here imagining like even the most basic anomaly detection has to be screaming. You know, if somebody's just systematically taking terabytes and terabytes of of data and and exfiltrating it. You know, so I, I guess maybe give me a couple ideas of of the kind of stuff um, that you would alert on once these models are trained and they know what what normal looks like. So. So something like that would obviously be trained for. Uh, what gets a fun scenario is just a query that's a fine query. It's a SQL query. It makes sense to you do that query. And it might even be a query that you know, you'd expect, expect certain people in certain roles to go make at a large volume. But what gets interesting is when you take a look at what the, the, the characteristics of a user class, meaning what their, their access privileges are, and what their normal role is, and this is where you do integrations with things that tell you something about the people, and say, hey, this is a normal query. This is a normal query for people in HR to make or people in finance to make. This is not a normal query for this person to make at this scale. And then that triggers an alert. That's that's a little bit more of an interesting scenario. And those are the interesting scenarios. It's like any of these things separately look fine. This combination of things, that can't be fine. There's something going on here. Uh, and either want to shut down access or quickly go talk to the person. So there's an example. So we have a we have a library of different. This set of patterns indicates this behavior. And when we started this, we'd say, "Hey, here's a few of them. You might want to watch several." And most customers try to provision to watch for all of them because uh, they're just saying, "Hey, there's a lot of complexity here. If you're going to go help me see these patterns, I, I will do that." So this whole data risk analytics area. Of uh, you know using machine learning, which is wonderful. I'm uh, a big believer in machine learning because it, it doesn't get tired. It doesn't make the kind of mistakes that people make, but it's always an augmentation for people's judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a, a big believer in machine learning to show you something, saying, "I think this isn't right." Why don't you go take a look? And it addresses one of the issues uh, that I often talk about with security products, where which I call the customization tax. 
And, uh, you know, back in the old days, like when I would buy a SIM, uh, none of the canned reports would be useful to me, you know, because, you know, the vendor doesn't know what would be useful to you, you know, to their different customers. You know, they have different uh, needs and requirements and, and, uh, and uh, constraints. And, you know, you just have to put in a lot of elbow grease, you know, to, to figure out what reports to create, what to alert on, that kind of thing. You know, I think that's one thing that machine learning has been helpful for is is kind of closing that gap, you know, to where, um, you know, you don't want the customer to have to do 100% of it, you know, but you don't know what you don't know, you know, going into, uh, you know, a, a new customer. Um, you, a, a great example is I've seen so many cases where something that would be like a five alarm fire uh, drop everything alert in one environment uh, looks totally normal in another environment because they do something weird or that, you know, they don't follow, <laughs> they don't think have things configured the, the normal way. And, and it's a false positive for them, you know, whereas for the other company, it's, it's the worst day ever. Yeah, you're right. You're right on it. Right on on that. Like the, the, the different rules that we have that people can go set as a default, because a lot of customers will just send it to default They'll make sure everything's operating, and then they'll trust that. But then, as the the uh, as the the model gets trained, it becomes more expert. It becomes more more tailored to them. I think it's just uh, uh, I I assume that as as IT uh, continues to evolve and be more powerful, that uh, we should fully use utilize modern technology to make it easier for whoever is trying to watch it and see what's going on and. Uh, having have the default configuration be very good, out of the box be very good, and only get better, and have it be uh, show what it's doing to get better in a way that people can go track. That's that's really the path the path forward for this, and that's and it does that automatically. It says, hey, this event might be okay for you, may or may not be okay for you, but I think you better go look at it. I think that's a that's a pretty winning play. Um, and that, that that's that's a very nice and hopeful note to end it on. I think, Dan, because <laughs> that's 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 really what we need. You know, is is uh, products that point us in the right direction. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much, Adrian, Tyler, and Katie. Cheers to you. All right. Um, make sure you visit securityweekly.com forward slash imperva to learn more about what we're talking about today. Uh, we also have some nice links in the show notes. And stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk software supply chain security with Eric Tice from YPRO. 